Andrew's right, uh, Ross, and Andrew and I are window dressing, and the real attractions are our guests, uh, several of whom were influential on us when we were students ourselves. I'm glad the Kibo guys are here to say something about Kibo, Ross, and I, and Leon Blue. I don't think anybody else. We are the three uh, Kibo representatives in the room who are actually part of the Kibo climb. In case you don't know, I'm still giving you time actually to finish your definition. Uh, Kibo is the summit of Kilimanjaro, tallest mountain in Africa. One of the amazing things about that mountain is how it rises up by itself. It's not part of any mountain range. So 15 friends uh, climbed Kilimanjaro in March of 1998. And on the way down the mountain, the more creative of them, who actually is the one who put this together, decided it would be a good idea, give us a good excuse to have a reunion in the future if we formed a nonprofit and named it after the summit, Kibo. And if that nonprofit would collect funds from our association with each other and others, network together to do good deeds in East Africa through the networks of which we were a part, most of us as missionaries or former missionaries in East Africa. And that's how Kibo began. The same ultra-creative person, Mark Morris, the one who had the, the brilliant idea of purchasing Midnight Oil a few years ago. He had that idea a long time ago. Most of us thought it was a bad idea. But eventually, as often happens when Mark Moore makes a suggestion, we were worn down by his enthusiasm and bought. Uh, so that's why Midnight Oil exists today, to do good and attempt to, to operate a business and do it redemptively. Welcome to my home room. If you come back at 8 o'clock in the morning, I can tell you the difference between Theravada Buddhism and Mahayana Buddhism, because that's what will be happening in the morning. But in the meantime, we talk about discipleship. I so wish I looked at the poster um, sooner than I did. I, I looked at it as I walked in the room. I noticed that it said, Studies in Luke. I will actually be speaking from the Gospel of Mark. Luke doesn't tell the story the way uh, that, I, that Mark tells the story, and it's significant how Mark tells a piece of the story that I'm going to repeat tonight. More than 50 years ago now, Robert Coleman wrote this book called The Master Plan of Evangelism. I brought my very old-looking copy just to admit that it's a very old thing. 1963 is when it was first published. This was the 1984 edition. It was its 37th printing. And since then, there have been many more. It's been translated into many languages. This is not about something trendy. If it were, this would be passé uh, long ago. Instead, Robert Coleman has a way of capturing the simple, features of Jesus as a master disciple maker. The book is called The Master Plan of Evangelism. And I've found it useful uh, even to this day. Uh, when he talks about the master plan, he divides it in these categories. Here is what Jesus did, he says, in essence. And since there are students taking this for credit, I'll write these words down. First of all, Jesus' way of making disciples was to work with a few. Our way, these days, tends to focus more on large gatherings, big assemblies, and invest a lot of attention in what happens there. Whereas Jesus, though he interacted with the crowds, as you know, he was focused on a handful, two handfuls, 12 guys, one of whom turned out to be pretty rotten. But the other 11 stuck. And because of their faith, their commitment, we're sitting here talking about it today. He selected a few. Secondly, he spent a lot of time with those few, Robert Coleman says. He calls it association, a fancy word for spending a lot of time with a few people. Rather than always spending his time with the crowds, he found the time to withdraw to lonely, lonelier places with just the twelve and spend time with only them. So selection, association, I have to look at the table of contents to remember his words for them. Consecration. And by consecration, what Robert Coleman meant was he required obedience. 
when he gave them an order, he expected them to obey. You call me teacher and Lord, and that's right, because that's what I am. Since I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. It wasn't a suggestion. He expected obedience, a feature of his disciple-making strategy that we'll have to come back and revisit in just a second. But he also poured himself into them very personally. His was not all cognitive or what we would call academic. It was a very personal investment he was making in these 12. Robert Coleman calls it impartation. Not only did he expect things of them, he demonstrated in front of them what he expected of them. As he said, as I've already mentioned, you call me teacher and Lord, and that's right, because that's what I am, since I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet. You should do as I've done. So they got to watch him interact with others, all kinds of people, various stripes, people that would have been shunned by the community of the faithful. At the time, he's demonstrating the right way to interact with people. He also delegates. He sends them out. We'll come back to this feature because that's actually the piece of his disciple-making strategy into which I'd like to take a longer look in my few minutes tonight. He delegates. He sends them out, and then when they return, they sit and process the experience. So there is some supervision involved. And all of it is in the service of reproduction. I have to say that one of the most difficult things for me to figure out in the 22 years that I've been back from Africa myself is how to do that in this setting where our educational delivery method is industrial. That is, it's an assembly line. It's like a factory. We bring them in for 50 minutes of Bible, then we send them for 50 minutes of math. We send them over for 50 minutes of English. And our way of delivering content of what we're calling higher education is as compartmentalized as our modern worldview. Not surprising because it is a reflection of our modern worldview with its penchant for compartmentalization. So how do I get past that when in the morning at 8 o'clock, when I'm talking about Theravada Buddhism and Mahayana Buddhism, there will be 92 students in the room? How do I invest in a handful of them for a long period of time? Would it not be better if I just picked, say, 12 and said, forget about this compartmentalized approach to knowledge. Why don't you 12 guys just follow me around for three years? Now, I wish I had a better role model to offer, but if, if I'm the, the go-to guy at the moment, follow me around for three years, do as I do, uh, watch how I talk to people, I'll send you out on little short-term forays and you'll talk to people kind of like I talk to people, you see me do it, you go do it, then come back and we'll talk about how that went. What if we just did that for three years? My guess is you would do poorly on the GRE, but you might actually be better in life if that's how we saw our responsibility here as educators. Jesus was masterful at doing this. I first became interested in the book in 1981, the year before we went to Africa, and it was because we were about to move to Africa. I knew the Great Commission. I knew that we're supposed to go and make disciples of the nations, that it isn't just a matter of organizing, inspiring worship assemblies and doing good deeds, although inspiring worship assemblies and good deed doing is an integral part of disciple making as well. Or perhaps more accurately a reflection of disciples made. But how do I do disciple making? What are the nuts and bolts of making disciples? So I was so impressed with a simple little outline of Jesus' way of doing it that at my home congregation in Georgia that was for the first time taking on a full-time long-term missionary and sending him off to Africa, I thought on Wednesday nights, uh, before I move, I will teach a Wednesday night class on the master plan of evangelism. Started on Wednesday night, Thursday morning the minister calls me into his office and said, so, with a, this glare on his face, he looked at me and said, so, when did you go crossroads? 
Most of you don't know what that means, except people in the back. I'd gone crossroads and didn't even know it. I said, what did you mean? He said, crossroads. This is a crossroads user's guide. Crossroads people use this. The crossroads Church of Christ in Gainesville, Florida, um, was winning lots of people to Christian faith on the campus of the University of Florida and catching national attention in the Fellowship of Churches of Christ. Now, part of the criticism came over this word, that a disciple maker would, would require of the person they were discipling certain things that weren't necessarily biblical. It was the discipler that would dictate to the disciple when they could date and who they could date and whether or not they could double date or, not, or single date how they should dress, if they could go home, all those kinds of things. In other words, it sounded pretty abusive, like disciple makers were overstepping their bounds in terms of consecration. In fact, I met Robert Coleman once. He taught at Trinity, was retired by the time I got to Trinity in Chicago, but I asked him about that. Have you heard about something called, what later became known as the Boston Movement, then the International Churches of Christ? Have you heard of them? He said, yes, I, I have heard of them. And I think they took that... Uh, Suggestion a little too far, he said. But I don't want to talk about them. Find people. I know many of them. I don't want to talk about them. Mainly because I, I grew weary through the 80s and 90s that if we talked about disciple making, we were scary to people. In fact, the word discipling was taken from us in much the same way that we couldn't talk about the Holy Spirit because of Pentecostal excess. We couldn't talk about discipling because of other excesses. Well, we must. You show me a church that doesn't know how to make disciples, I'll show you a movement that won't survive into the next generation. We have to be adept at disciple making, which brings me to Mark chapter 6. This glimpse into the genius of Jesus as master disciple maker. It's in the beginning of the chapter, Verses 6, 7, 8, that he sends out the 12 on a short-term mission. And then in verse 30, they return. I'll read in Mark chapter 6, verse 30. The apostles gathered around Jesus and reported to him all that they had done and taught. Then, because so many people were coming and going that they did not even have a chance to eat, he said to them, come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. Good idea. Let's have a retreat. Let's process the short-term experience you've just had. And goodness knows they need the processing. In Luke chapter 10, Jesus sends out the 72. When the 72 return, they're high-fiving each other. I mean, they're saying, Lord, even the demons submit to us in your name. And from Jesus' response, which I'm not exactly sure what's in his response, but... Uh, what's between the lines of his response? In Jesus' response, he says, I saw Satan fall like lightning, which I think means he's saying to them, you ain't seen nothing. I was there when Satan got kicked out of heaven. Or maybe more positively, it means, yeah, I saw that happening as you were casting out demons in my name. I saw them coming out from a distance. I saw it happen. Isn't that wonderful? But it's the however in the subsequent verse or verses that makes me think he's not pleased with their response. They're excited about the wrong thing. And he says, however, don't be glad that the spirits submit to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. That's the right thing. You're excited about the sensational thing, the carnal thing, the visual thing. Be excited about the ultimate, that your names are written in heaven. And I just hear him like a shepherd with all these sheep without a shepherd, knowing how many names are not yet written in heaven. And these guys are excited about something less than what they should be. They need the processing. Verse 32, so they went away by themselves in a boat to a solitary place. But many who saw them leaving recognized them and ran on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of them. When Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. So he began to teach them many things. By this time it was late in the day. So his disciples came to him. This is a remote place, they said, and it's already very late. Send the people away so they can go to the surrounding countryside and villages and buy themselves something to eat. You know it's coming. You've read this before. 
he's about to feed 5,000 people with a handful of food. Did you know that the feeding of the 5,000 is actually an interruption in what Jesus had in mind? Because he intended to retreat with his disciples to a lonely place so that they could process this short-term mission from which they've just returned. And yet, once again, the crowds are too great. The disciples want to send the people away. He says, no, they're sheep without a shepherd. Let's tend to them. These interruptions. I mean, as a type A guy with a lengthy to-do list, I find interruptions so annoying. I don't know who said it first, but I'm thinking of a Henry Nouwen quote. Henry Nouwen, the theologian who himself is referring to a conversation he had with a professor at Notre Dame who was retiring and cleaning out his office, looking around the room, he said, you know, I used to complain all the time that my work was interrupted so much, and now I look back and realize that the interruptions were my work. Jesus got really good at this, responding to interruptions. In chapter 5, He's on the way to heal Jairus' daughter and this other woman with a serious health problem interrupts. And then he gets there too late, except, you know, the story, it's not really too late for him. It's all about interruptions and how he responds. This is an interruption. And the disciples want to resume the retreat. But, verse 37, he answered, give them something to eat. 5,000 people Plus, according to Matthew's account, women and children. They only counted the men. That's a lot of people. You give them something to eat. They said to him, that would take eight months of man's wages. Are we to go and spend that much on bread and give it, them, give it to them to eat? John's account says it's Philip who asked the question. And had Philip known the Chinese proverb, I'm sure he would have thrown that in too. You know, you give a man a fish, you fed him for a day, teach a man how to fish, you fed him for a lifetime. This is not the time for development principles although those are good to talk about. You know, these are hungry people. We're not going to teach them how to fend for themselves late here in the day. Give them something to eat. And in verse 38, Jesus says, How many loaves do you have? He asked. Go and see. How many loaves do you have? Do you think Jesus already knows how many loaves they have? that they didn't exactly pack a picnic baskets to feed the masses. Reminds me very much of a, of a conversation once in a hut in rural Africa at a place called Epke. Epke was on the side of the Cario Valley, it sloped down like this. Up here's the plateau, there's the valley, that's Epke. Epke means cut the tree, because they had to fell many trees to find a place to live on the walls of that valley. About a hundred families lived there. I got there either by hiking up or by hiking down. There was a road that the car could travel on, but if it ever rained, and it often rained, it was too slippery to get back up, so I didn't want to risk it. I would hike there. Hike to Epke. I was sitting in a hut once at Epke. Michael, a brand new infant Christian, just a little bit older than I am in years, but new in Christ, sitting across from me in the hut, a dark day, several other men around me. Michael looked at me and said, Arab Sang, my African name, Arab Sang, what are you going to do for Andre? Which was a perfectly reasonable question. Andre was a polio victim, mid-30s, little spindly legs that had never developed past maybe five, six-year-old legs, bent up behind him. But he lived in Epke. He actually lived right about there. There was a mud schoolhouse with a, a nice tin roof where the church was gathering, this young infant church. Michael would crawl on his knees up to meet with this new church. He was a brand new infant in Christ as well. So here we're sitting in a hut over here, in a hut over here in Michael's house. Michael, who ran a small business, he was the, the wealthiest person in the neighborhood. Michael, who knows that up on top of that mountain, there's a $25,000 Toyota four-wheel drive Hilux that I drove there in. He knows I have connections to a lot of resources back on the other side of the rainbow that's connected to a pot of gold. And he's looking at Andre, who crawls everywhere he goes, can't afford a wife, can't afford to plow even his own field, looks at me and says, what are you going to do for Andre? And immediately I'm thinking, boy, I could do all kinds of things for Andre. 
I could take a single picture. This is back in the 80s, before the internet and all that. These days I could use my cell phone, take a picture, and probably raise, mo raise money overnight. Surely we could buy Andre one of those uh, hand-powered wheelchairs that are so popular in the developing world, except it's going to be a super-duper hand-powered wheelchair to do him any good there. I mean, it would be better if it were a hand-powered jetpack or something like that. But we could raise all kinds of money for Andre. People are going to see he's a polio victim, the poor guy. I mean, I could tell you more of his story. That would just tug at the heartstrings of so many. Yeah, I, I could do a lot for Andre. Is that really what Andre needs me to do? So, thank the Lord. And the Spirit of God gave me a little bit of wisdom on the spur of the moment as I pondered his question. And I said, well, tell me more about Andre. What does he have? What are his resources? And they told me, well, he's got a little piece of land right by his door. You see where he lives, though. It's on a wall. I mean, you can't really plow that. I said, is that all? They said, well, actually, he has another plot of land right over here by the school. It's only an acre. I said, right by the school? It's relatively flat? It's about like that, but flatter than that. They said, yeah. And I said, well, why doesn't he plow that? Andre's sitting right there, by the way. I said, why doesn't Andre plow that? And everybody just laughed. Ha, 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 ha. Funny joke. And they all understood why Andre doesn't plow that. I, I said, no, I don't understand. Why doesn't Andre plow that piece of land? They said, you know Andre can't afford the beer, the beer that you have to make, and you have to pay for the ingredients to make the homemade beer, the beer that you use as compensation for the people who come and plow your field. That's how you pay people, day laborers, with beer, and he can't afford to make the beer. So no, he can't afford to plow the field. And I'm thinking, okay, brand new infant Christians, they don't understand the whole concept we call church quite yet. I said, well, here's what I'll do for Andre. I'm coming next Thursday. I have a bag of corn seed at home. I'll bring one can, a tin can of corn seed, and I'll bring my hoe, handheld hoe. And I waited, was praying that someone else would speak up and volunteer something. And Michael looked at me as if he was getting it, and he said, well, I have a hoe. And I can bring a can of corn seed. And I can be here next Thursday. And John, Chesina, said, very poor guy, by the way. He said, well, I've got a hoe, and I've got a can of corn. I can bring a can of corn seed. We went around the room, and everybody pledged one can of corn seed, which is really all we needed, as long as everybody showed up with their weaponry. And next Thursday, we came. We got there out in the field pretty early. And after we'd already started this part of the field, I mean, I had to choke up. I had a, a, a regular flatland hoe. They had all these very short hoes for steep hillsides. So I had to choke up on mine, swing it with your, your, your right hand, then throw the rock with your left hand, toss the rocks, form big piles to try to clear this one acre of land to plant Andre's field with Andre. Andre out there on his little bony knees with a short little hoe doing the same thing right along with us. And as we worked, another group gathered in the field next to us. They worked maybe two hours, then stopped and started drinking the homemade brew that their host had provided, which is the typical compensation. And then the more and more tipsy they got, the more they made fun of us. This little Christian group, the only Christian group of any kind, by the way, on this ledge that is Epke. That's true to this day. They started making fun of us, well, mainly because I stood out in the crowd, as you can imagine. Does that boy really know how to work? Andre, they called him out, Andre, what are you going to feed these people? You got nothing. You got nothing. And I said, Andre, don't listen to him. You've got us. And we planted that field. How many loaves do you have? What resources do you bring to bear on this kingdom work? And instead of responding to meet an, an immediate need, how can we think in the long run? What will bless the Andres of the world long after the Arab songs of the world have gone home? 
what would bless him more than being surrounded by a group of disciples who get it? A group to which he himself can contribute from his resources. And yes, Andre himself on his bony little knees that don't quite work. Andre, who still crawls everywhere. Andre has resources to bring to bear on the work that that little church does, even to this day. What if Andre is surrounded by a, a group of Christian disciples who get it, who know that Andre has a place and that they are to be family to him? Won't that bless him much more than some hand-powered wheelchair that really won't do him any good there anyway? How many loaves do you have? Jesus asked the disciples who think they're empty-handed. So, they go off and they look. When they found out, they said, five and two fish. Turns out that was Andrew. Seems like it's always Andrew's job to find other people who he brings to Jesus. In this case, according to John's account, he brings a little boy. He's got his lunch with him, five loaves and two fish. And Jesus says, fine, we'll start with that. That'll do. You've probably already come to discover in your life that Jesus can do a whole lot with very little. So they get organized. Verse 39, Jesus directed them to have all the people sit down in groups on the green grass. So they sat down in groups of hundreds and fifties, taking the five loaves and the two fish. Looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and broke the bread. Surely in the Hebrew way. I thank you, Adonai, ruler of the universe, who brings forth bread from the earth. And boy, is he about to bring forth some bread from the earth today. I don't know where it came from, but it's coming from somewhere. It must be coming from the earth to feed 5,000 people. Then he gave them to his disciples to set before the people. He also divided the two fish among them all. They all ate and were satisfied. And the disciples picked up 12 basketfuls of broken pieces of bread and fish. The number of the men who had eaten was 5,000. And according to archaeologists who study the upper Galilee of the time, they would tell you that the population of that region just on the northern shores of Galilee couldn't have been much more than 10,000. At least half the population is assembled there that day and they all got a meal. Starting with very little. And then the, the next story. In verse 45, immediately Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to Bethsaida while he dismissed the crowd. After leaving them, he went up on a mountainside to pray. When evening came, the boat was in the middle of the lake and he was alone on land. He saw the disciples straining at the oars because the wind was against them. About the fourth watch of the night, he went out to them. That's between three and six in the morning, your NIV study Bible will tell you. Walking on the lake, he was about to pass by them. I don't usually linger over that line, but I'm going to linger over that line. He was about to pass by them. That intrigues me. I'll come back to it. But when they saw him walking on the lake, they thought he was a ghost. They cried out because they all saw him and were terrified. Immediately he spoke to them and said, Take courage, it is I, don't be afraid. Then he climbed into the boat with them and the wind died down. They were completely amazed for they had not understood about the loaves. Their hearts were hardened. Well, what should they have understood about the loaves? The same thing they should have understood about the healing of Jairus' daughter who had died and was now raised from the dead, about the healing of the woman with the internal bleeding problem, about everything else they've seen Jesus do that's miraculous. They should have understood about all that, that this points us to the conclusion with which Mark begins his gospel, that Jesus of Nazareth is the Son of God. Only God in the flesh could do such things. But their hearts are hardened. They're not getting that message. Instead, they're out on the boat again. This is a rerun. This happened in chapter 4. Another storm on the same sea. They're terrified Jesus happens to be with them in the boat this time. And they say, Master, don't you care that we drown? We do it again. So I go back to verse 48. He was about to pass them by. The old people remember an old song. You know, pass me not, O gentle Savior. Don't pass me by. Please don't pass me by. He's about to pass them by. Why would he pass them by? What is that about? And I may be too, reading too much into this, and it's time for me to quit anyway. But here's a thought. I don't think he's trying to scare them. I mean, by walking out on the water, 
looking like a ghost. I mean, real human beings can't walk on water. He must have died. He must be a ghost. I don't think he's trying to scare them. I think he's checking on them. I think he's seeing how they're doing in this storm compared to how they did in the previous storm. And the bottom line is, they're not ready yet. They're not ready yet. Now, it's only chapter 6. He's going to be with, with them a lot longer, but it's obvious to him they're not ready yet to be turned loose. They don't yet own this thing. Which brings me back to us. To you. How many loves do you have? What are you bringing to bear on the kingdom? My own church, when I hear people talk about they this and they that, well, we don't give money at this church because we don't know what they do with it. And I'm talking about members of my congregation. We don't know what they do with it. And I think, who is they exactly? Is it they, us? That's baby talk from the high chair, from people who don't own it who are not themselves invested in this work that we have in common, this work that we share. It's all weekend long we ask ourselves, how many loves do we have? What are the resources God's given us? And what are we going to do with them? And we'll be reminded once again that if we offer whatever it is we bring to this kingdom, to him, he can do an awful lot with very little. And that's in the spirit of discipleship. Let's take 10 minutes and come back and hear from Gary Selby.